Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change. So we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Looking around the globe in places that really need to have the Emerald Planet and the best practices, one of those is Nepal. A very beautiful country, ancient traditions, wonderful deep culture, fantastic people, delicious food, and someone who absolutely loves this place. This is Dr. Malcolm, goes by Mac, J. Odell, Jr. He's a Valuation Training Sustainable Development Specialist for what's called the Appreciative Planning and Action Consulting, APA, and has been working with Nepal now for almost well, 40 years or more than 40 1962. years. 1962. I tell you, that's Count absolutely backwards. fantastic. And one of the first uh, Peace Corps. The first. Uh, yeah, uh, that ever uh, came out of the United States going around the globe. So looking at uh, APA, tell us what is the mission and vision of APA, and then let's get into why Nepal. Okay. The, what we're trying to do with APA is create a simplified, easy-to-use methodology for promoting and generating empowerment among local communities to take up their own development simplifying the development process to something that anybody can do anytime, anywhere, without uh, taking a lot of time. Yeah, and we're gonna get into that, and I, what you've done is absolutely fantastic, how you distilled this down to really only three main questions. That's it. And you keep repeating those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at Nepal, we've got some absolutely fantastic uh, images of Nepal. What are we looking at here in this mountain range? Well, you're looking at the you're looking at the third pole of the United States, of the world, the third pole of the world. We got the North Pole and the South Pole, but the highest peaks in the world are in the Himalayas, and it's really like a third pole for the globe. Yeah, you know, I never really heard of that until you and I met, you know, some years ago. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But looking at the location of Nepal, what's unique about it, and why is it such a special place? Well, there's no place like it on the earth because at the lower end of Nepal along the Indian border, the Ganges River, just about sea level, and then 100 miles north to the tallest mountain in the entire world. From zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds, if you will, <laughs> in, in sports car terms. 100 miles going to 30,000 feet. And what is the name of that mountain? That is Mount Everest, in case you don't remember. I think you're just pulling my leg. No, and I'm Mount not pulling Everest. your leg because people here are yeah. watching us all over the globe. Right. So, Mount Everest. Geez, what mountain is that? Mount Everest is the one mountain that probably m most people in the world have heard of. Yeah, but, that, but what's so special about well, Mount Everest? Everest? You, one of it you talked about its actual height. What yeah. else is so special about Mount Everest? And then let's kind of back down the, the mountain range, the valleys, into the floodplain oh, of oh, Nepal as it joins yeah, India. Yeah. What's so special about all this? What's so special about that? First of all, the environment is an incredible thing. Where else in the, in the entire world would you see an ecosystem where across 100 miles you're going from jungle to glaciers? And you've got glaciers that are actually uh, keeping this world safe, mm -hmm. the climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping ice, keeping it intact, and if we don't protect those glaciers, we're gonna be in big trouble. But then you come down the mountains and you come into incredible farmlands, terraced farmlands, where on a tiny patch of land, 
carved out of the side of a mountain. People are raising food and feeding their families mm -hmm. on land that we could never farm. Mm -hmm. And then you go down further to the jungles and you've got, you've got wildlife like you can't believe mm -hmm. in the only country in the world that does not have any poaching of wildlife. Yeah, and this is an incredible story. We're going to talk about that as we, uh, we move forward. But tell us about uh, the various park systems and the nature that you have in Nepal. And then we're going to get in because we're really talking about this great Himalayan trail project right, exactly. and joining the entire end to end of this country together like the Appalachian Trail in the eastern United States right. or the Skyline Drive in Virginia and, and North Carolina. Or, South the, Carolina. Or, or the great walks across the moors of England. The beauty in the trail will be that you go every day, you'll be a little lodge, a little place to stay and sleep, so you don't have to carry all your stuff. Well, anyway, we'll get to that. But, uh, but Nepal uh, has, in the lowlands, this incredible jungles which were originally set aside as royal parks for the royal reserves for the kings and the, the Rana masters who ruled uh, for several hundred years, it was keeping the king in sort of a uh, house arrest, if you will. So they, they created these, these hunting reserves, mm -hmm. which became eventually national parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they did that, they, they got the idea that you know, people like to come and see these par parks, see the animals, and tourism took off. At the same time, other tourists began coming, and they wanted to go see Everest or Annapurna. Mm -hmm. And so trekking became uh, a very popular activity in Nepal, and communities along the trails to those two peaks began to say, hey, the trekkers are going by with all their backpacks, all their porters, all their gear, their tents, their food. Why don't, you know, maybe if I opened a tea shop, uh, maybe they'd stop in. Maybe if I had a little restaurant, uh, maybe. Well, it just goes grassroots tea shop trekking became a, a signature of Nepal. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it was all owned and run by the local people. That's no it. corporate Sheratons or, or, or corporate, mag, you know, tra 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 travel agencies, no American Express. <laughs> yeah. And we're looking at some of this right here. Yeah. So tell us the, the special nature as far as the hospitality and the hosting that one, you know, has and enjoys, which I have, uh, from Nepalis. Well, we as volunteers, when we went to Nepal in 1962, I think we were innocent and we, we sort of thought we were going into the wilderness going into these mountains. We got, we got training in mountaineering and sh rappelling and climbing and we got backpacks and working out and had, uh, doing exercises to be, and we went to Nepal thinking we're gonna go up into, the, into these mountains and find people in hovels, you know, poor, miserable people in little hovels. We, will, we went up the hills, two day trek, two day trek to get to my village over a big uh, river up a mountain we get to the village and it's flowers along a paved road paved with stone and beautiful homes whitewashed with thatched roofs hospitality post office and the post office uh, the mail came in on a runner who ran from Kathmandu for for 10 days to bring the mail and mm -hmm. go take the mail back but they had hot clinics and schools and I was invited to teach in a boys in a boys uh, a high school and I was going to teach uh, vocational, uh, vocational training, a little vocational carpentry and skills along with English and, and science. And uh, here we are, we found we're, we're, we're not an outside civilization, we're right in the middle of a mm -hmm. civilization, just a different civilization mm -hmm. than what we're used well, to. Well, looking at these villages, and we have a, a photograph of one of those here is absolutely fantastic because, I mean, it looks like suburbia yeah. you know, somewhere around, you know, in the United States, not really a rural area, but really suburbia. Exactly, and there it is. And the people were so hospitable, unbelievably hospitable, you know, and uh, we also began to learn that they knew more about any of this thing. We had nothing much to teach them. Sure, we could teach them some vocational skills and- And, and, and uh, English, of course. And English and some science, yes, we could do that. Um, but uh, for the vocational skills, um, I found that uh, we couldn't, we couldn't find any good tools 
So I looked around, I said, there's carpenters here, and there's blacksmiths here, they've got tools. Where'd they get their tools? They made them themselves. So mm -hmm. I brought the blacksmiths and the carpenters in, and they showed us how they made their tools and taught us how to make tools. And, and then we made, we kids would make their little bird houses, you know, mm -hmm. the things. Mm -hmm. But what happened was the students and the faculty s uh, said, you just brought untouchables into our school. Mm -hmm. And you just showed our Brahmin Chetris the worth of these so-called untouchable craftsmen who had incredible skills. And that, that rippled down the generation. So those kind of changes were really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the mountains and uh, Annapuna and uh, Mount Everest, what is the significance of that as far as drawing people into Nepal? and allowing this uh, new ecotourism to really flourish in this area. And some of it called experiential tourism, people coming in to really experience, just like you, uh, you went there yeah. for two years, yeah. people are coming in for two weeks yeah. to actually live in the village uh, and well, do something. And you, pr you probably know this, people come in and they spend two weeks trekking in the mountains and they come back and their life is completely different. Mm -hmm. It's a transformational experience. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was transformational for all us Peace Corps volunteers. Right. And we learned to respect these people. Uh -huh. And that was the beauty of it all, was we learned how, how much richness and culture and tradition and knowledge and wisdom there was in those people. Well, the, the thing about this, too, looking at this photograph right here, is that you learn respect for nature itself. Yes. Because nature, no matter what people say, you know, we got human beings, we got animals, we got plants. We got the, the microorganisms, those are all live. But actually nature itself is a living being. Uh, yes, totally. And that's something you learn through the religion, through yeah. the culture and of you, Nepal and other places. And the people are in, totally integrated with that nature. They're totally integrated with that environment. And it's part of their life and the, from morning till night, they, they are, they are with, within it and they also worship it, honor it. Mm -hmm. with various festivals and things. It's now looking at uh, these mountains here, you know, people think this is incredibly hard. It is hard. I lived on a ranch and we had, you know, we're in the mountains and it's really tough. You know, the soil has lots of stones. It's not very easy to, you know, graze your cattle to do all those things. And yet you're looking at, you're just in awe with the beauty of this. Yeah. So looking at this experiential tourism, uh, this ecotourism, how is this going to mesh in with this beauty so that we don't despoil all this beauty, but allow the people to capitalize on it and still continue to honor it in a way that they know traditionally? Well, How do we do that? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. You build on what they've got because we talk about ecotourism. Guess who invented ecotourism in Nepal? The people did, just as I mentioned earlier. They saw trekkers going by and with their tour, with all their backpacks and their, mm -hmm. uh, their, their Sherpas and their porters and their gear. And they said, why, why you know, we, I, if I had a tea shop, they might stop and I could make a little money. So and the next one says, I could, I could have a little place where people could stay. And, mm -hmm. and people would, and then another guy would say, well, I, I could take people out to see the wildlife. And, and uh, so others would say, we got song and dance that we do. We could do a little show off some of our culture and dances and stuff. And so they, they started doing that. So uh, this is richness and they within did it, the culture, and right? And they did it on the, the, on the route to Annapurna right. and Exeter uh, on Everest, but not anywhere else in the country. Yeah. But they've, got, they've got to have all this richness there. Yeah. So what do you see for the growth and expansion of this ecotourism uh, this experiential tourism, say over the next five, 10 or 15 years, we got about 20 seconds to do that. Okay, first of all, quick. everybody's seen the, the, uh, the traffic jam on Everest. Well, the traffic jams are on their routes to Everest and Annapurna. The whole idea we're thinking is get, get ecotourism across the entire country, not just concentrated in these two hot spots, if you will. This is Dr. Mac O'Dell of APA. Thank you for being with us as we're looking around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Looking at the country of Nepal, a very interesting ancient society, unique location, dynamic people, much to share with the world, yet in many ways isolated. 
But yet there's a young man sitting right beside me who decided a number of years ago that he was going to go in and actually be learning from the people at the same time that he was going to be sharing the ideas and the skills and the talent that he had. This is Dr. Malcolm J. O'Dell, Jr. He's the Evaluation, Training, and Sustainable Development Specialist as what's called Appreciative, and I like that term, Planning and Action Consulting, APA. So looking at the the organization, APA, why the term appreciative? What's, what's about that? Well, that's the key to the whole thing. Because in development, most people around us and with us and through us and ourselves included, always got into development looking at the problems and what we could do to fix them. And what happens is they only got worse. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the American Psychological Association, which for years counseled couples on on how to solve their problems and have them talk about their problems. And then Marty Seligman, the head of the of, of American Psychology Association said, folks, we've been doing all this great counseling for 50 years and the divorce rate is going through the roof. We've got it all wrong. We're, we shouldn't be looking at the problems. We should be looking at their successes, mm -hmm. the joys, what are the beauties of, and how to make more of it. And that's where Appreciative Inquiry was born. Mm -hmm. It's Case Western Reserve University uh, simultaneously found that by looking at what works and what's good in a company, they could, and what's even better, uh, they could actually get much more positive change than trying to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So we focus on appreciating successes. And there's a wonderful story from the NASA's, was it the Columbia that have blew up because of the O-ring failures, mm -hmm. and it almost brought NASA to its knees, and they they argued and quarreled and debated for months to try and find why did the why did the O-rings fail, and one of their guys went down on the floor of the assembly line, and w he was he saw a guy sweeping the floor, and he said, Charlie, what do you think, what do you think caused those O-rings to fail, and Charlie looked around. He says, Boss, I got no idea, but I'll tell you something. Those, those O-rings over there never failed. They were looking at the failures, but the right in front of them were O-rings that never failed. That's what we're, we're building on. We look at appreciating, mm -hmm. looking at the positive. And that's what you're doing with these uh, children we have right, right in front of us. But you were in the Peace Corps, fantastic experience. It really set your life's course, so you've been doing it all across the globe. But now you're back in Nepal and you're looking at this great uh, Himalayan trail project. Why back to Nepal after all these many years? And why do we need to have a 538 mile long trail from one end of the country to the other to bring new development and this ecotourism or experiential tourism well, as it's now being called? We didn't go to Nepal to create a great Himalaya trail. We went back, one, because we love Nepal. Mm -hmm. And two, they were trying to take the park experience along the Terai and bring it into the mountains and develop some national parks in the mountains. And, and they needed uh, so technical assistance for that. And I was invited to be co-project manager to open up a new park, a new national park, Makalubarn National Park between Everest and the Arn Valley on the Tibetan border. Can you believe that? I was getting paid for that, Not no more volunteer. I went up to, to start seeing what we could do to draw up some kind of participatory conservation and development. Because mm -hmm. in the years since we left Peace Corps, we found that the big buzzword in development was participation, participation. And we were gonna get participatory development of these new parks. Now looking at this area right here, talking about this new park, why is this area so important? to have a new park, and how did that really become a catalyst for something that's much grander than what you were thinking about at the time? Well, it's pretty interesting, because Everest was well known, and there are a lot of people looking at Everest, but right next to Everest is the second largest mountain in the world, Makalu, and the environmental ecosystem around Makalu is unbelievable, untrammeled, no tourist trap tramping all over it, beautiful ecosystem, religious sites, mm -hmm. temples, sacred caves where monks are meditating, and wildlife ab in abundance, and flora and fauna of the hundreds of kinds, and we wanted to protect that. 
and we were we were going to we were so called we were going to be the experts, you know, to try and develop mm -hmm. a new national park. But we found we la we missed something, and then that's when appreciative planning and action came into the picture. Now, looking at uh, APA, this appreciative yeah. uh, planning, action yeah. and plan. Uh, why is that, when you look at this, this area, you're saying, how could you do anything different with this? One, it's naturally absolutely beautiful, as it is, but yet at the same time, the people want to do more with it than what they've had in the past. So you have this convergence of, you know, you have this pristine environment, you have people that really want to do more and better themselves, they're inviting you mm -hmm. to come into it. So how do you take this APA style and, and do one better than what's already there? Well, it's, it's, that's a very good question because we thought we had something to offer. And we, we were participatory planners and we were conservation experts and all that. But, we're d but Makalu, like all the parks in Nepal, are different from national parks anywhere else in the world. They're full of people. There are hundreds of villages throughout these national parks. You're gonna go in and tr kick the people out to protect the wildlife? No. You got to involve the people so they own it and mm -hmm. they feel protection for that. So we were struggling to find a way to do that. And my friend Budi Tamang, who was on our team, said, you know, we always are looking too much at the problems. He said- and This all, goes back to the earlier story about yeah. the O-ring, same thing. Yeah, he said, we all, we all, we just look at the problems and we gather the problems, we collect all these problems. And then, then we take these problems and we, we uh, plant them and we cultivate them and we water them and we uh, fertilize them and we grow up whole new batches of new problems and then we send them away to some university in the other side of the world and they send us back hybrid problems. Mm -hmm. and we said, that's not gonna work. We need to look at things differently. And so we began going to, and using, we thought this appreciative, this appreciative inquiry thing might work and we started doing it in our office try and fire ourselves up by looking at the good stuff rather mm -hmm. than the bad mm -hmm. stuff. And it just, we find our team was getting fired up. Mm -hmm. And then they said, we gotta take this to the villages. This mm -hmm. is, they need it more than we do. Mm -hmm. So we, took, we, went, we went off to the villages. I took off my hat as a manager, gave it to Brian Penniston, my partner, and I put on my Peace Corps backpack and with 12 of our staff members, we started going from one village to the next, to the next. And it's amazing, you know, just villages. like this photograph here, the, yeah. the, the people, the expertise, mm -hmm. the, the wisdom, yeah. uh, you know, the hundreds, thousands of years of knowledge that they have sitting right there. And, and we, so now, leveraging we, that with APA. We had to tap that. And we, 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 we began to run meetings using this appreciative inquiry method. And we found the women were not coming into only the men would come to the meetings. And we asked, why, we, why can't, aren't you coming to the meetings? We want the women to be part of this. And they said, are you kidding? You guys just talk all day and their meetings <laughs> go on for hours, sometimes days. You do your thing in a couple of hours, first thing in the morning, at the end of the day, uh, we'll be there. Now this is the women saying this. The women say that. Okay. So we looked at ourselves, we gotta trim this thing down, mm -hmm. streamline this beautiful process out of Case Western Reserve University. And what we, we, we essentially what we did is every time we had a meeting with any villages, we said, what did you like best about this meeting? And what, should the, what would make it even better to the next village? And using their feedback, mm -hmm. we trimmed it down and down and down and down until we just got to these three basic questions. Mm -hmm. And we could ask these questions and work with the people for just a couple hours. And we were just asking questions. We weren't telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. We were just asking them questions and yeah. they got excited. Now looking at uh, these villagers and talking about the excitement and getting involved and uh, using uh, native wisdom and you know literally hundreds and thousands of years of knowledge and all that. What, what did you learn out of this? You've told me these stories and I want to share this with our audience here about what you really learned, and maybe use the toilet as, a, as an example, I, which I, I think th is just fantastic. That's not a bad idea. What first thing we learned was the incredible knowledge and wisdom that they already had right there. The second thing we learned that what really wasn't much we could teach them. We should be learning from them. And that's why we were using questions. Now, we were not teaching them anything. 
We were just asking them questions Socratically, which got them thinking about different things. And allowing them to, to, to yeah. bring all this wealth from no, without them right, themselves right. and their villages. And, and if you want to know about the latrines, we, we were trying to promote. Yes, look, I think this yeah, is a fantastic you example. Know, development workers all over the world are still trying to persuade people to build latrines. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're teaching them about sanitation and this and that and the other thing. In, in Nepal, along the trekking route that was coming through, through Makalu, uh, we consulted the villages. What, 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 what do you think you need, need to do? What would you like to do to make this village even more attractive than it is? And they said, well, we've got to have latrines. No nope, trekker's going to come through here unless we have latrines. And they've got to be clean latrines. You know, but we've been talking about building latrines for years. But if we're going to have trekkers come through here, we got to have latrines. Uh -huh. And you know, and it was one meeting, there was one meeting I was in when at the end of the meeting people said, hey, you know, the tea's not here yet. Uh, you'll be here 15 minutes. I'll bet you we can build a latrine in 15 minutes. <laughs> and they jumped up and they ran out and said, Charlie, I mean, Ram Bahadur gets a hat shovel and, and Bim Bahadur gets some sticks and, and women get some mats, some bamboo mats and dig a hole and, 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 and Ram Bahadur bring a couple of planks and they dig the hole and they put a couple of planks on it and a bamboo mat around it and a little curtain across the top and a little, 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 little uh, bamboo mat on top and the kids plant flowers around it. 20 minutes, a lot beautiful latrine. And, then and they they've been talking about this for years. Years. And then they look at it and they said, hey, we could do this in every house. And the next thing you know, they said to us, come back next month and we'll show you how many latrines we got. Now tell us you what see, happened next. And we never suggested the okay. latrines. Get tell us that. what happened next. What? But tell us what happened next. What happened next yeah. was... You had the... Party. Oh, wait, uh, that comes later. Oh, okay. Oh, no, okay. We, you're jumping ahead of me here. Oh, okay. okay. Right. It, we, we were still discovering, and we were still coming to discover these three questions that came out of it. And we finally, the c complicated appreciative inquiry method boiled down to three questions. First of all, what's working? What's the good news? What are the successes? Share your successes. What do, you, what do you love about this village? What do you love about this environment? Now, say those three things again, because we're going to go out on those. Okay. Number three two. Three questions. Number two, what's even better look like? What would you like your ch village to look like for your children and grandchildren? And third, how are you going to get there? What's your action plan? Give it to me quick. Three, what, with the three R again, quick. What's working? What's even better look like? How do we get there? Fantastic. Okay, this is uh, Malcolm O'Dell from APA talking about the three questions that we need to present in uh, villages so they bring up their own uh, salvation, they bring up their own solutions. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Looking at the country of Nepal, what can be learned from the people there? How can that be applied not only in Nepal, but around the globe? And how do we actually develop principles and concepts and ideas, but also best practices, which can be universal, coming from a very ancient and traditional society, but yet in many ways is quite progressive and willing to change when change is important. And a gentleman that's gonna be talking about this this is Dr. Malcolm J. Odell, Jr. He is the Evaluation Training and Sustainable Development Specialist for Appreciative Planning and Action Consulting, APA. And we're talking about conflict resolution, backing that into development and to community improvement. So what's this about conflict resolution? And this is a process that there's even entire curricula around yeah. this. But You've done this in a, a more simplistic but a very profound way. Tell yes, us about indeed. that. Yes, indeed. Yeah, after we, uh, after we developed the basic method up in Makalu. Uh, now, I what are the basic methods? Go over that, those three principles. Those three questions. Okay. What's working? What's even better look like? And how do we get there? I want to do it one more time. What's working? Mm -hmm. What are the successes? What's even better look like? What do you want for your children and grandchildren? Got it. Okay. And how are you going to get there? Right. Okay, super. Now going to the conflict resolution, this all centers around a hydroelectric dam. Yes. And why the, why well, the hydroelectric dam and why conflict resolution? I had, a, I had an opportunity, having spent time at Makalu, to be invited down as social, uh, social 
social science e e e expert and health, health and well-being or something like that. I don't know what I was supposed to be bringing applied social sciences into mm -hmm. this hydroelectric dam project. And what, w not long after I got there, the, 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 the project was building a huge, huge hydroelectric dam. Uh, and they built a beautiful road into the dam site, paved road, lovely road, going in and trucks and, and bulldozers and all kinds of equipment were racing up and down this road past about 20 villages. And the villagers got, began to protest. They said, look, you're going to build this beautiful dam. What's in it for us? Mm -hmm. All this equipment going by and we're sitting here in our villages. We need schools. We need the clinics. We need uh, agriculture. We need uh, all kinds of things. And what are we getting? And they said, oh, you're going to get electricity. Oh, yeah. OK, we're going to get some light bulbs in five years. Yeah, well, big deal. But uh -huh. meanwhile, like we got sick kids and we got <coughs> anyway, they they decided to strike and block the road and they shut the project down. And when you shut down a multi-million dollar project, it runs to about a million dollars a day. Lost that's real money. That's real money, yeah. And so <coughs> we, the social science experts, were called upon, what can you do? Go out and persuade those people to stop protesting. And we said, we can't stop them from protesting, but we can go out there. Let's try a little appreciative planning and action. Mm -hmm. So we went out and we Going got back to the three questions went again. out there and the we met, found all these angry villagers all gathered around, and we said, <coughs> maybe we could have a little meeting and discuss some things. And we said, first of all, what, what is it you love about this village? What do you love about this environment? Oh, they got really excited, and they began talking about it and telling stories, drawing pictures of what it was. And then uh, we said, OK, what is your dream for your children and grandchildren? Oh, well, they had all these ideas, and they wanted a clinic and schools and this and that and the other thing. And one of the things they had was the, a, a community forest. They wanted a community forest adjoining their village. So they'd have timber, fuel wood, and so forth. And so we said, OK, um, that's your dream. How are you going to get there? Well, we're, we're starting the community forest. As a matter of fact, that's our number one priority. And we're all taking turns uh, to provide social fencing. And we said, what the heck is social fencing? And the village headman says, Social fencing means that I, everybody in this village, every, every day one of us takes turns and we patrol the area of the park, of the, far, of the new forest, and we keep the animals out, keep the goats out, keep the sheep and so forth, and we protect the seedlings so they'll grow, because we can't afford fencing, okay? Great. Well, we said, how are you going to get there? Well, we're going to continue planting and and protecting this area. We hope it'll be a beautiful thing for our children and grandchildren. But we, but, but we really, um, we, need, we, need some, we need to get seed seedlings. Mm -hmm. And I turned to my staff, I said, aren't we raising seedlings to reforest the areas we're destroying with our bulldozers? Oh yeah, yeah, we, can, we could help you with some seedlings. Oh, you could help us with some seedlings? Oh, oh my God, get out the drums and dance. Let's, and next thing you know, it was raining like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. It's raining, and the people are pouring out, bringing out beer and tea and everything, and they're having a big party celebrating. And that was the end of the protest. No protests ever again. They were going to get a community forest. Chip stuck, skip ahead a, 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 about a year, and the project's going on. The villagers are all engaged. They're all helping out with the project, and they love it, and they're planting trees like crazy. And they came and they said, you know this beautiful road, when you guys are gone, it's gonna, the first monsoon is going to take it out. We've got to protect this road for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to plant trees along both sides, and they'll help stabilize that road. And if you could just provide some seedlings, we'll plant them. And they planted 62,000. The women planted 62,000 trees. 62,000 trees. trees that, that is road. incredible. And 25 years later, that road is still there. Monsoons, earthquakes, landslides. That road is still there. Model Green Road became the foundation of a green road movement in Nepal. That is absolutely fantastic. And but looking at the face of, of these children and their future, but also looking at this as from the past, yeah, yeah. Uh, how does this change these societies, these communities, so that they're looking forward, okay, we have these three questions, 
and we don't need a Mac Odell coming in here and earning his you know seven figure income from exactly. coming in here exactly. we can ask these questions to ourselves exactly so how do these so, children and, learn these skills and that was the beauty of APA and he, once we done it with them they knew it we didn't have to come teach them mm -hmm. and remember we're only asking questions we're, we're, they have the expertise they have the knowledge they just need to discover that they've got the knowledge and we celebrate it for themselves yeah but looking at these children, how yeah. do you pass this on so you know this becomes part of the culture, not something is just added on it's to the a, culture? Well, the fact is that in Nepal, this method took off like gangbusters because it was showing to be co totally successful. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you about the Women's Empowerment Project in a minute. But they started using this, and then we began training. We trained trainers, and then we, we trained the, all our t staff. Then our staff began to train other staff, mm -hmm. and then our our staff got in touch with Marsha's, my wife's, uh, Women's Empowerment Project down in the Terai, and they said, you know, this method might be useful for women's empowerment, because we're empowering these villagers, and they're building trails and latrines, and they're doing all kinds of stuff. Oh, planting trees. Yeah, and they're yeah, planting trees, so, and so she said, no, I don't want my husband messing around with my project, <laughs> and this appreciative inquiry stuff is a lot of Pollyannish you know, touchy-feely good stuff. Women have real problems. Mm -hmm. And then she went to Bali on an assignment with her company. They had a meeting and, and they left her local staff. She was the only expat. And they left the local staff in charge. Soon as she left out, you know, when the, mi when, the rat, when the cat's away, the mice will play. They came down and they said, come on, show us how to do this. <laughs> and so we ran, went out to a village. We said, pick the, pick the nastiest village you can think of that where people are really depressed and, and not very cooperative and then let's get seven people and we'll each go out and ask some questions into the village and we got them and I said- And we see a photograph of this actually, uh, this process going okay, on. There it is. And, and we, we, we uh, got in the vehicle, went out to the village and, <coughs> and uh, then I said, uh, before we left, I said, if I can't teach you how to do this in 20 minutes, you can never take this to 125,000 women, which is what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you gotta learn this. So I sat them around and we drank tea and I said, okay, here, here's the first question. You're gonna ask this, who's gonna ask the second question? Who's gonna ask the third question? And then, by the way, we got a couple others that we'll bring along the side. And we taught them how to do this, went out to this village, and in two hours, this village was mobilized for ecotourism. They wanted people coming through, they wanted trekkers to come through, that was their dream mm -hmm. for the future. But they said, this, dirty, this village is filthy, dirty, paper bags blown in the street, plastic, and it's a mess. Let's all, look, the tea's not here yet. The tea's not here. So let's this is always the excuse. Yeah, when yeah. a tea doesn't show up, it's time to go do something. That's correct. right. So let's go out. Everybody collect some, some of the junk and bring it here, and we'll have a bonfire. And then, by the way, who's got a drum? Let's dance. And that was the next little question, Joey. Who's got the drum? Let's <laughs> dance. And they would dance and celebrate. And then they said, come back in a month, and we're going to show you our latrines, and we're going to show you a clean village. And this, that, and the other things, and we got in our vehicle to go back downtown, down to the city, Kathmandu, and the team, my team of 25-year professional community development experts from Nepal, all very, very experienced in community development, they looked around each other, what the hell happened? <laughs> We've been doing this for years, and never have we gone into a village that they don't ask us for something. These people only asked us to come back and see their latrines. Yeah, and that's in a month. And it's yeah. amazing how it's in a month, come back, and we'll be ready for Show you. Show us. And so anyway, when Marsha came back from Bali, they Which said- Which is your wife. My you wife. Reintroduce her. Yeah, reintroduce Marsha. They said, come on, Memsab, Memsab. Come on, Memsab, out to this miserable village out here, another w miserable village, and we're going to show you how, they, how this method works. And the next thing you know, these people are going to build a school. And they've got, they're collecting rocks, and they're going to carry them up the hill to start building a school. And then everybody's singing and dancing. I think you might see a picture of her. Yeah, right, her we, got it, we got it going right you now. We got her going yeah. there to dancing. So, and so she said, sold. <laughs> <laughs> and she be, and we, we then began to train all her staff. She had, she had about uh, 100 mainline staff and 800 village workers. That's we, an incredible number of personnel. Yeah, and we trained them all in the APA method because mm -hmm. it's so bloody simple. We had to teach them three questions and a couple extras like what to do, what, what can we do right now to get started, and who's got a drum, 
Let's I was dance. going to say, and who has the drum? Who has the drum? Let's <laughs> dance. And they but did looking it. at these villages, I mean, these are absolutely uh, pristine areas. You see people walking, you know, through the fields and all that. So uh, we're just about out of time, as always is when we get together and talk. So looking at this APA and what you've done as far as women empowerment, and we're going to deal with this a, a little bit more. But what what is the the long term benefit? all of this what what am I hearing in your words that says we can do this three simple questions find the drum and do the dance of course and this is the outcome it's very simple because what what the long-term outcome is that people can take this themselves and do it and and I can tell you when they took it to the women's empowerment project they went out to do a survey and they were training everybody in the method and the survey, how are they doing the first six, eight, 18 months of the project, 125,000 women, and wh what are you doing? You, are you able to write your name yet? Because it's literacy, savings, and, and enterprise. Can you write your name? Have you learned to read? You starting to keep track of numbers? Can you, do you have a business? Do you have any, did you make any money this month and so forth? And the team came back and they said, these women in 18 months, yeah, they're starting to read, write, but they've created. 60,000 businesses. That's incredible, 60,000 businesses. And she yeah. said, no, impossible. Go out and do it again, that's a bunch of baloney. Hold that thought. Uh, this is Mac O'Dell, this APA. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Looking at the country in Nepal, as a worldwide lesson, and I guess we can call this an international model program, and is brought to us by Dr. Malcolm J. O'Dell, Jr., Valuation Training Sustainable Development Specialist for Appreciative Planning and Action Consulting. And looking at this, uh, I'll call you Mac, this he goes, that's what he goes by. Looking at uh, taking this, the, the Great Himalayan Trail, we're gonna talk about that in depth. How is this in some ways going to expand the tradition of a very viable Nepali society? In other ways, how is this actually transforming a very classical traditional Nepali society into something that's even better, but yet not giving up necessarily their traditions or their local wisdom? Well, first of all, uh, when we were up in Makalu, when we were sitting around drinking. The Makalu is where? Makalu Barn, where I think in an earlier episode we talked about the Makalu Barn Conservation Project, mm -hmm. where we developed the basic three questions that drive this whole process. And those three questions are? What's working? What's even better look like? How do we get there? Fantastic. Thank okay, you. so having developed that and having shared that with the Women's Empowerment Project and learning from them some tricks about empowerment art, the getting people to draw pictures, and getting them to share success stories. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, I, I think I mentioned in a previous program that they had created 60,000 60, businesses without any training. And when we- Now uh, let's repeat that, yeah. 60,000 new businesses With without no actually even training, training for no that. No training. The program was literacy, savings, and, and uh, ultimately, making micro businesses mm -hmm. but they were still in the savings and and uh, and reading learning and reading part of the program when they had 60,000 new businesses and when asked how the hell did you do, uh, excuse me how did you do that they said we did just what you told us every meeting every workshop everything we do we start with sharing our successes and there was a woman in my group who had was selling chickens and I thought maybe I could sell eggs Another woman said, maybe I could sell vegetables. And the next thing you know, we had a, every woman in our group had a business. Mm, that's you absolutely know, fantastic. You know, and the tr training materials that were supposed to be developed to, to teach them how to do this were still in the cooler, hadn't come out yet. Now looking at the trail. This so is that, that was what drove the trail. Okay. Because right. we said, if, if that can happen on such a large scale, why can't it happen on a 500 mile trail going from one end of the country to the other? 
taking ecotourism from its narrow slot into Everest and Annapurna, where it's pummeling the environment and pummeling the, mm -hmm. the it is too crowded. Let's spread it out so that people will, from one end of the country to the other get some of the benefit and can show off the culture, the beauty, the wildlife, the snow leopards mm -hmm. of their in their in their country. Yeah. Now looking at this so, trail and so uh, again. Uh, end to end, it's about 538 mm -hmm. miles. Mm -hmm. And so why choose this particular route? Why not somewhere else? And why in the, the very upper portion of the, the culture and the country uh, versus being at the lower levels? Well, there are roads in the lower levels. People can go those places by road, but people love to go trekking in Nepal. Mm -hmm. Trekking in Nepal is a dream for most people. Who would ever think of it, they could do it. And, <coughs> but there's, there's, there's only these two places that are really too overcrowded. Why not show, the, show off the diversity of cultures, language, people, religions across the entire country? Mm -hmm. All these wonderful villages, beautiful villages, and people will then have a real goal. Is it? This is like the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you only walk on it for a day or two, you have the vision that this trail goes from Georgia to Maine. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I retire, maybe I can do the whole thing. But you can do it in small pieces or large pieces. But in Nepal, there's going to be a road village, a tea shop, a restaurant, and homestay, small lodge. And as more tour tourists come through, bigger and bigger lodges, mm -hmm. all owned and operated by the Lowell people. Now, looking at this map here, we have uh, major names for all these different areas. Are these some of the national parks that they have you're tying together? Explain yeah. this National Park yeah. Service now, now and the trail. Well, since, since, since uh, Annapurna and Everest showed the, the power of, of, the power of, uh, of uh, ecotourism, mm -hmm. uh, but didn't spread it anywhere, we thought, let's see if we can get it going across the country, okay? In other words, do it in the beginning. In the beginning, mm -hmm. right. So, so we start one batch at a time. We, have, we, we plan to have five teams of experts, because Nepal now has experts in APA. They've taught themselves, they taught each other, and they're teaching others right now. Mm -hmm. I just got an invitation to a workshop. One, one of our colleagues is running on APA. And, <clears throat> and, and we'll put this to work on the trail. Uh, to get and these parks are all across Nepal now, and they're all using a similar model of community ownership, mm -hmm. getting the communities to own the parks. And there's one story that's particularly good about that, when we had been doing the APA thing for a while in Makalu, we got a radio call from the far end of the, of the park. A five-day walk away, the ranger station said, the people are camping out in the middle of winter in the park looking for poachers. They've rounded up a bunch of poachers. They brought them to our ranger station. What do we do? And my partner, Dustin Ryan, say, you, first of all, you congratulate them. Then you take the poachers all to the police post, book them up, put them in jail, file charges, send their trophies to wildlife headquarters, then go back to the village where they came from and throw one hell of a big party. <laughs> you have sacrifice an ox or something, a barbecue and a big party, and you thank the people and tell them, God bless you, keep it going. Mm -hmm. And he put the radio down and he said, Mac, they own this park. The people mm -hmm. own this park. We can go home now. But instead of going home, we went, and started the idea of the Great Himalaya Trail. Yeah, and we're looking at uh, different parts of this trail. This is actually just an absolutely pristine area. It's very beautiful. So how do you work with the people, or do you even have to do that? They, they intuitively understand they have to protect it, they have to keep it clean. This keeps coming out in the narratives that you're sharing about the villages. There's a saying, it, our, our village is really dirty. We need to clean it up, and they go clean it up. But you know what? It takes it takes a stimulus. Mm -hmm. It takes a little stimulus because they don't necessarily think that they can do this. They, because if they'd been part of the Makalu project, and if the Makalu people had come down and taught them how to do it, that would be different. But they're they're in these little villages doing their farming and doing their things. They really haven't th thought it through. But when we come in, gather them together, and we ask them those three questions. They see, they say, oh my gosh, look at the possibilities here. And they grab them and they run with them. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, and that's the way we do it. We start in one village and we and move to the next village and we ask them how it's going. And then we say, would you like to go to the next village with us? Maybe you could run the meeting in the next village. 
and that we create a cadre of people who go from village to village. So this is the train the trainer, you're actually training them and creating them as you're moving as along, we're moving along village yeah. to village. So we don't have to do all, f all 500, what did they see? Yeah. yeah, we don't have to do all 500 villages. We just need five teams to start the ball in five different spaces and let them go from there to there. We start with a little pilot project. Mm -hmm. My partner Brian was just out doing a pilot with the Snow Leopard Conservancy, mm -hmm. and we're tying in the Snow And this is the same thing. Have the three yep. questions, let them answer them, and then yep. just progress from there. That's it, yep. And, and instead, of, uh, instead of building latrines, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in, uh, in building latrines in, uh, in, in, in remote areas, they're gonna build them in their own areas. They're gonna build them in their own villages. Mm -hmm. And the same for the trail, they improve the trail make it better, clean up the villages, make it attractive, talk about who's gonna start a tea shop, who's gonna start a restaurant, who wants to start So with a each home of day. these conversations are in each, each of the villages, yeah. and then this can be replicated yeah. along this trail through these yeah. 500 different and villages. And if we're lucky, we'll have some women there from the Women's <coughs> Project who will come and say, hey gals, why don't you start a savings club? And start a savings club, and you'll be the village bankers to bank and support these activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where it goes from there. Now looking at these uh, four photographs we have here, again, these are absolutely pristine areas. They're really gorgeous. But what are we seeing and what are we not seeing here that makes us long-term and permanent in these four different areas as an example that we're looking at right now in this photograph? Well, first of all, um, we're starting to see communities get together as owners of the environment. Mm -hmm. they, they recognize the environment like those people up in Makalu. This is our forest and we don't want poachers. We want snow leopards and we want people to be able to see the snow leopards. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some snow leopards and I could take people to go see the snow leopards. But if we don't take care of this environment around us, those snow leopards are gone, that's mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. So they, they see that protection of the environment is income in their pockets. Mm -hmm and they, they respond accordingly. Okay, and what would be the next, next lesson? I'm gonna to try to mm -hmm. bring three lessons out of this. So we got one, you know, if we're gonna protect the environment, we bring one. people in and we have to do it, okay? Okay, first of all, the lessons is you're getting conservation for climate change. These people on a 500 mile trail along the whole length of the country are gonna be creating a sustainable environment mm -hmm trees, forests, community forests of their own like they did in mm -hmm. Kaliadaki. And those, those, that, that is going to be green, more greening of Nepal. And if you look at satellite imagery of Nepal today, and you look at it 25 years ago, you'll see the reforestation of the Himalayas is already taking place because mm -hmm. of this participatory mm -hmm. approach to, right. to, okay. to and so that'll be the first thing. Same thing it would be sharing culture, so the richness of these cultures. People don't know about Rai culture, Limbu culture, Sherpa culture, Brahmins, Chetris, all the different castes, including the untouchables who now in Tankuda, my village, are on the city council and running, running uh, hardware stores and a computer store, but who, which started with bringing an bringing a untouchable into the high school part of it. And the third thing would be incomes be raising, raising the incomes for <coughs> some of the poorest yet proudest people in the entire world. And that'll be making a difference. Economic empowerment, this will make Nepal prosperous. Okay. We have 30 seconds. So I'm gonna leave this photograph we have up here, this pristine scene of Nepal. Using these three questions, how can we take this around the world to solve problems? that have some that are even more profound than what you found in Nepal, but equally, it seems like, can be solved with these three simple questions. Well, I go back to the Columbia catastrophe. PhDs galore, trying to fig find out what was the problem and not recognizing that if they just look for the successful O-rings, they'd be way ahead. This is what we've, over, we've overcomplicated and we've done, our, all these PhDs like me have made the development process so complicated that only professionals can do it and they have to get training and it goes around and around and we never run out of, of need for more and more training, more education, whereas development practitioners can take these three questions and bring about change 
immediately within two hours going on and then come back two years later and find it's still there. Fantastic. Thank you very much and thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet.